This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Well, things are starting to get pretty interesting inside Rhode Island politics as we make our way towards 2022 in terms of the gubernatorial race. In fact, even inside some of the other statewide and other races, it's starting to kind of come together. And as anticipated, 2022 is going to be like the Super Bowl of Rhode Island politics Uh, No doubt about it. It's Bill Bartholomew here with you for another edition of Rhode Island's podcast of record, B-Town. Today, we welcome back Rhode Island General Treasurer Seth Magaziner in his first appearance on the pod as a gubernatorial candidate in a six-way Democratic primary. I mean, who knows if anyone else is going to jump in at this point? Maybe you are. Are you thinking about running for governor in the Democratic primary? Or perhaps you're thinking about a run for lieutenant governor where that field is starting to get a little bit crowded. Apparently, Joe Trillo, remember him? He's thinking about jumping into that conversation, according to Ted Nisi over at WPRI. So look, things are getting interesting. The governor's race is obviously going to be the marquee event, certainly the Democratic primary in particular. And the thing that'll be really fascinating to watch, and we'll certainly be talking about here on the podcast, is how the candidates define themselves and compare and contrast with the other five candidates in the race. That's something that General Treasurer Magaziner does today here on the pod, at least in some detail. Um, We get into a number of other key issues that are highly relevant in this moment, but then can also be used as part of an overview of Magaziner as a candidate. Remember, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Bill Bartholomew and join the Bartholomew Town Podcast Facebook group for even more content. And if you'd like to support the pod, there's a few ways you can do so. You can Leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. We always appreciate that. And if you want to go a step further, for as little as $3 per month, you can become a B-Town Insider. You'll receive exclusive content at the $10 per month level. Simply head to patreon.com slash Bartholomewtown or click the support link wherever you're listening right now. What's it like to have officially announced all the speculation is over? Obviously, this goes back a month or so now to when you were we were all standing there in Pawtucket and you made your announcement, but... Now you're a candidate, you're in, it's official. What's it like? Well, first of all, thank you for having me back. It's great to be back. And, um, you know, our first month uh, on the campaign for governor has been great. We've been getting a lot of support. We've had some big uh, announcements the last few weeks, Uh, got an endorsement from the state nurses union, from uh, a number of community leaders from across the state. Uh, I've been very encouraged by uh, the outpouring that we've been getting, and it's exciting. You know, I, I love getting out, uh, meeting Rhode Islanders, sharing ideas, hearing feedback, and um, I'm very optimistic not just about uh, the campaign, but also about the future of Rhode Island. We're at a really critical point where we have tremendous opportunities, so I'm very excited. I think right now, one of the things that sort of bubbled to the surface of conversation is what to do with the American Rescue Plan Act dollars, the the $1.13 billion. The McKee administration has issued a proposal for the first 10% of that that is, you know, there's some acute areas that they're they're looking into. And of course, there are some general stuff, uh, general things. What would you do if you were governor right now? How would you manage this? What would you present to the General Assembly for a supplemental budget? Well, this gets very much to the core of why I'm running for governor. I'm running for governor because I want to build an economy in Rhode Island where there's really opportunity for everyone, regardless of zip code, regardless of background. Every Rhode Islander deserves uh, to send their kid to a great school and to get a great job here in Rhode Island without having to leave the state. And we are at a unique moment in our history right now where we've had tremendous challenges over the last year, uh, year and a half, but we also have tremendous opportunities, including. Uh, this gusher of federal stimulus money that's flowing into the state, not just the $1.1 billion uh, of ARPA funding that you referenced, but also potentially much more to come from uh, other pending federal legislation. So when it comes to the stimulus money specifically, uh, I would like to see a couple of things. First, I have been a big supporter of the Rhode Island Foundation's public process because I believe it is vitally important that this not be figured out just behind closed doors at the state house, but that there be a real public process where anyone in Rhode Island can submit their ideas, their ideas are vetted out in the open, and there's real community engagement. So the Rhode Island Foundation process is one that I've supported. I uh, went and appeared early in their process and presented some of my ideas. Um, and I've been encouraging everyone on our social media and otherwise to really engage with that process, because I think it's important that there be openness and transparency and accountability in how this money is spent. 
And the accountability part is going to be especially important once money starts going out the door. We have to make sure that there's real transparency on where that's going. So the Rhode Island Foundation just released their recommendations this morning. I think there's some very good ones there. Um, but the process is important. In terms of things that I would like to see prioritized, it's those things that will help us build a stronger, more modern economy in Rhode Island. So top of the list for me is uh, workforce training and education. There's a real mismatch between the job openings that employers have and the education and credentials that many workers have. And so we need to close that gap so that people who are job seekers have the credentials and the skills uh, that line up with the jobs that are available. And so no surprise, I was very pleased to see in the Rhode Island Foundation recommendations this morning uh, a big uh, investment in workforce training, because that's something I've been talking about since we launched the campaign a month ago. Uh, another thing that I want to see prioritized is 21st century infrastructure. That's not just roads and bridges, but that's also broadband access, climate resiliency, and housing. Housing is infrastructure, and we have a huge shortage of affordable uh, housing in Rhode Island, especially for low and moderate income. So those are some of the things that I would like to see prioritized, education and workforce training, uh, 21st century infrastructure. Uh, a lot of that lines up with what came out of the Rhode Island Foundation this morning. And so uh, those are the things that I'm pushing for, because I think those are the things that will lead to more good jobs and a stronger economy for everyone here in the Ocean State. I think specifically right now with the housing, there's a lot of focus on the rollout of the rent relief RI dollars, of which RI Housing is managing. That's essentially a third party. It is a third party group. It's not a state organ, um, office or anything like that. They've only gotten about $50 million out the door in a package that includes in excess of $300 million. Yet at the same time, there's a lot of people who are falling behind on their rent. They're anticipating as the winter months come along, there's going to be challenges there. It seems like an arduous process to fill out the application. We've also heard reports of community engagement or um, they, they're calling them eviction clinics where there's simply not even close to enough personnel on the ground to help people. In one case at, at uh, the Providence Career and Technical Center, over 100 people were turned away. How would you correct this, this issue? Well, it's terrible. And I've actually been speaking out on this since the spring, since May. Um, I started sending Rhode Island Housing letters and speaking of their board meetings back in the spring because even within a month or so of the, pro of the program launching, the rent relief program launching, it was clear that they did not have a plan to get money out the door to people who needed it. And so, you know, then this has been covered in the media. I've had several back and forth with them expressing my frustration. And I think that you hit on the two big problems. The first is that there was not a real marketing plan to get the word out about the program. And there was not a real community engagement plan to work with organizations that are actually in the communities that are most impacted to help get the word out. So, you know, initially there was no paid media plan at all. There was no real stakeholder outreach. And this was something that, you know, was evident to me at least back in the spring when I started being vocal on it. The second problem is that for months, Rhode Island Housing was requiring all kinds of unnecessary documentation and paperwork that went beyond what the federal government was requiring. So for example, the federal government uh, was allowing a lot of things to be done through self-attestation, where rather than having to upload a bunch of forms and, and documentation, you could just certify under penalty of perjury that you, know, that you were having a COVID-related hardship, that you were behind on your rent, et cetera. Um, right on housing, even though the feds were allowing that, right on housing wasn't. Uh, same with um, uh, landlords who weren't being cooperative. Uh, you know, the feds had allowed a process where if a landlord was not being cooperative on their end, uh, but the renter was behind, that uh, it would be possible for the renter to get that relief without the landlord. Uh, and so what ended up happening is, and again, I sent letters, I spoke up at board meetings all through the spring and the summer. Finally, about a month ago, the Biden administration came out and was very explicit with states and said, not only are you allowed to waive a lot of those paperwork requirements, we, the Biden administration, are telling you that you should, <laughs> that you should waive those requirements. And just in the last few weeks now, we're starting to see some real policy changes at Rhode Island Housing. You know, in my seven years as state treasurer, we have managed some complicated 
customer facing programs. We run a state pension system with 60,000 participants that, you know, need to get those pension checks every month because that's their, you know, what they pay to, uh, what their source of income is to survive. We run the state's college bound program, which we took from one of the worst rated in the country to one of the best rated college savings plans in the country that helps thousands of people save for the cost of higher education and apprenticeships. I'm running for governor in part because I have experience running and managing complicated programs, customer facing, public facing, complicated programs and managing them well. And so I know what it takes to clean up programs like rent relief. I've been advocating on it for months and I want to bring that experience that I have uh, to the governor's office. Another thing you mentioned is climate resiliency. Right now, there's this back and forth playing out on South Water Street in Providence where the South Water Street uh, urban trail, it's basically a bike lane that removed one lane of motor vehicle traffic, retained the same number of parking spots, and installed a bike lane that basically connects the downtown Providence to the East Bay bike path. There's been whether you're talking about Sharon Steele, who is the the president of the Jewelry District Neighborhood Association, or the letter sent by DOT Director Alvini, there's been pushback on this to the point where there's allegations that there's a 1999 agreement violated. In other words, the state and the city are on a different page with this. The state, at a certain level, is presenting the idea that this should be torn up and, and the road restored. How would you handle these types of, of improvements to frankly, greener uh, infrastructure and also balance the concerns of businesses? Yeah. Well, listen, I think this is a, the South Water Street situation is a symptom of a larger problem that has gotten worse over the past year, which is lack of communication between the city and the state. And so, you know, when I'm governor, I want to work closely with whoever the mayor is. We will meet regularly. We will have standing meetings and we will uh, have a uh, two-way line of communication on all issues, whether it's infrastructure and resiliency or the Providence schools or, you know, whatever else it may be. Um, You know, I've frankly, as a Providence resident and a Rhode Islander, uh, been frustrated by the fact that the current governor and the current mayor don't ever seem to talk to each other. And a lot of these problems could probably be dealt with just through better communication. Now, on climate resiliency generally, yeah, I mean, this is one of the biggest challenges Rhode Island faces. We are the ocean state. The Narragansett Bay has risen six inches in the last 30 years. So think about it, in our lifetimes, the Narragansett Bay has risen more than half a foot. Yeah. And that is terrifying. And so while it is vitally important that we do our part by reaching net zero um, uh, emissions and 100% renewable electricity by 2030, we also have to prepare ourselves for the likelihood that even if we do the right thing on transitioning to 100% renewable uh, electricity, other places around the world may not. And so we have to prepare ourselves for the impact of climate change. So what I would like to see Rhode Island do is uh, first require every city and town to develop a resiliency plan that's very specific. What drainage systems need to be improved? What roads or bridges need to be raised? Are there sand dunes or marshes that need to be restored? At a very specific level, develop a a resiliency plan in every community And then we should probably use either stimulus money or or more likely a large state bond to fund some of those projects. Interesting. Um, And it's very similar, by the way, to the process that we used uh, when I was co-chair of the state school building task force. Uh, We started by doing a study where we sent teams of engineers to every public school building in Rhode Island to catalog the conditions of every school building in Rhode Island. And then we developed a funding plan to address those needs. And the statewide school construction program that uh, I led the development of uh, is off to a tremendous start. We've already allocated a billion and a half dollars to repair and replace 176 school buildings. That's the majority of the public school buildings in Rhode Island, creating more than 20,000 upfront jobs and helping more than 100,000 students a year who pass through those buildings. We're building new high schools and we built one in East Providence. We're building more in uh, Newport and Central Falls. Uh, new elementary schools in Smithfield and North Providence and Cranston, new middle schools in, uh, in Barrington, new, uh, new everything in Pawtucket and significant upgrades in Providence. So, you know, I think that's a good parallel just because the school construction crisis was one that was, you know, a few years ago, people were saying this is such a big, expensive problem. How are we ever going to solve it? We did find a way to make a once in a generation significant 
upgrade to school buildings statewide, I think we use a similar process and a similar approach um, on climate resiliency. This episode is brought to you by Elmwood Songwriters Club, presented by B-Town. It's a monthly showcase featuring seven artists from all around the region, with the order drawn at random, each artist performs two songs. You can find details about when the next event is here in Providence by following me on Twitter and Instagram at Bill Bartholomew. As the calendar year 2022 approaches, there it looks like there's going to be six candidates inside the Democratic primary for governor. And that's assuming that, of course, Governor McKee does, in fact, enter the race. All indications are that he will, but who knows, maybe uh, decides he wants to play that much more golf or something. I don't know, but he'll be, he'll likely be in there, but assessing your candidacy, your campaign against the other candidates right now, Helena folks, the latest to enter is going to present a business minded, sort of a moderate version of, uh, of a Democrat. Then you've got someone like Matt Brown, who is, you know, he's got expletive Phil videos. He's going to tear down the state house. Then somewhere in between there is Dr. Munoz and Secretary of State Gorbea in terms of the political spectrum. How do you draw contrast in a crowded race like this? It's a good question. The thing that will set us apart is that I have a track record of using state government to create jobs and strengthen the economy in Rhode Island. Every candidate will talk about the economy. Every candidate will talk about all these issues, education, housing, climate. But I am the only one that has a track record of using government to do big job creating things in Rhode Island, like the school construction program, where we have uh, allocated funding to fix and replace 176 school buildings, which not only is putting 20,000 people to work in those upfront jobs, but is also going to better prepare Rhode Island students for the jobs of the 21st century. The work that I've done, you mentioned climate resiliency. The mention that I've the work that I've done at the Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank, where we created uh, clean energy financing programs my first year in office that have put 2,000 people to work on alternative energy projects across the state, wind turbines, solar panels, uh, energy efficiency at the municipal level. Uh, I have a track record of creating jobs there. Uh, we created a program called Bank Local, where we've moved millions of dollars of the state's money to local community banks and credit unions to support business lending, uh, small business lending, and helps hundreds of small businesses get loans to hire and expand. So I think the thing that will set me apart from the rest of the field and the reason that I believe our campaign will be successful is because I have a track record of actually using government to deliver on core economic issues and create jobs here in Rhode Island, a record that I will put up against anybody else's. They don't even have a candidate yet in all indications, just from my own private conversations with some of the big names, quote unquote, that are being touted by the Rhode Island GOP as potential candidates um, aren't even committing in any way, shape or form. But Republicans in Rhode Island at the gubernatorial level have a track record of being able to win when matched up against someone. And the word progressive isn't even necessarily the right word. But you think of Mirth York or Charlie Fogarty. That was a very close race, of course. But in terms of in a general do you believe that you would match up in in a general election against a Republican candidate that is perhaps a bit more moderate than a, you know, yeah. a Trumpian candidate and win over those independent votes, win over the business oriented votes and be able to deliver for the Democratic Party? Yes, for two reasons. Um, first, I think the Republicans are going to be hard pressed to find anyone that has a track record of uh, delivering on economic development and jobs from state government like I have. And I do think at the end of the day, the voting public, whether it's in a primary or a general, cares about who can deliver on jobs and on the economy. And I've shown that I can. I don't know who the Republicans will put up uh, that could have a record that would match ours. The second reason is, you know, I think the reason that in the past, sometimes the Republicans had some success in gubernatorial races was because there was a dissatisfaction with you know, old school politics, Rhode Island's perception of being a corrupt political state. And, you know, that feeling by voters is is valid. Sometimes they would maybe elect a Republican who they disagreed with on the issues just because they wanted to have some checks and balances in place. But I think that we get around that by uh, virtue of the fact that in the seven years that I've been treasurer, uh, we have governed that office in a way that is 
honest, ethical, and transparent. You know, I, I fired the financial advisor that was involved in 38 Studios. We overhauled the college bound fund. We dropped a lot of uh, expensive hedge funds that weren't performing well because it was the right thing to do. And so um, I think that whoever the Republicans put up, we will win and we will uh, uh, be the next governor because. We have a strong track record on the economy and we have a strong track record on on transparency and ethics in government. That kind of feeds into my final question here. There was a recent Wall Street Journal article that said that that stated Rhode Island is the sixth most corrupt state in the in the country, putting us alongside Mississippi and Alabama, so on and so forth. Your gut instinct on that, because that's that's a platform piece that some of the candidates in the primary are certainly running with as really their primary issue is Hey, look, where there's this is a whole the whole machine's broken. We're going to tear it down. Your your instinct on that is the whole thing broken, or is it just small portions of it, or, or are we not a very corrupt place? Well, nothing will stop our economic progress faster than the perception that Rhode Island is a corrupt uh, political state, right? If we want to have a strong economy, if we want to have this be a place where there's good jobs and opportunity for everyone then we have to move Rhode Island past the reputation of being a corrupt political state, full stop. We will not have a strong economy or opportunity for everyone if that's our reputation. And the fact of the matter is, you know, in Rhode Island, we had more than our fair share of political scandals. So that is why when, you know, even just recently, there's now two active state police investigations into the current governor's office. That's very dangerous because We cannot afford to have that kind of a reputation if we want to grow the economy and create opportunity in Rhode Island. So, yes, I mean, part of why I am running for governor is because I believe that in order to grow the economy, we need to have uh, a governor that does everything in an above board, ethical and honest way. I've shown that I can do that, that I have that approach uh, in the last seven years as state treasurer, and I will bring the same approach to the governor's office. General Treasurer Seth Magazine are now a gubernatorial candidate in the Democratic primary. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for having me. Rhode Island's podcast of record, B-Town. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits, and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com/employers.